So have you ever actually wondered what happens when you find some buried treasure or some sort of national treasure-esque hall of ancient loot? Well, want to know more? To begin with, as ever, in just about everything, the answer to that is, well, it's complicated. The bottom line is that most countries have laws that regulate what has to be done when something precious is found. And disappointingly, usually it has to be given to an authority for the sake of scientific research. As to whether you'll get paid for it, well, we'll get into that. First, when objects like coins, jewelry, or other objects made of precious metal are found, and they are so old that no owner can be attributed to them, they are classed as a treasure trove. This is the legal term deriving from the Anglo-Norman trésor trove, which means found treasure. It is very close to the modern French trésor trouvé, which means exactly the same thing, found treasure. As mentioned, most countries have laws governing the finding of such found treasure. As you might infer from the fact that there are set laws on the books pretty much in every nation of the world concerning treasure troves, this sort of thing actually isn't totally uncommon, owing to the fact that burying treasure was once a relatively common thing. Such treasures are called hoards in archaeology, and as banks were not available to protect treasured items in ancient times, burying them to later unearth them was an easy solution. Time periods with a high occurrence of hoards can be interpreted as indicating times of unrest. If a person who buried the treasure does not come back to unbury it for various reasons, like forgetting where it was, hurriedly having to relocate to another area, or, you know, death by Viking or the sort, the hoard remains to be found by a lucky person. Buried treasure could also be offerings to gods. Especially in hard-to-access places, this is a likely interpretation, as it would indicate no intention to retrieve the treasure. Apart from hoards, burials are another source of artifacts such as coins, jewelry, etc. Burial rites vary a lot across time and place. In many cultures, it was customary to bury quite valuable objects with the deceased, for example, ornate weapons or jewelry. Of course, this has attracted looters in ancient times as well as today. So burials could contain valuable things, but really any place where humans did, well, anything artifacts can potentially be found, like settlements and, of course, battlefields. All these treasures from hordes, burials, and other sources are just lying there waiting to be found. Some have made it their hobby to search for these treasures with a metal detector, though interestingly this is not legal everywhere. But a metal detector is not always needed to unearth treasures. Sometimes objects are unearthed without anyone digging for it, be it by natural processes like freezing or erosion, but sometimes because of plowing. This is why walking across plowed fields in a systematic fashion is a common method for looking for archaeological digging sites. Objects found during these field surveys are precisely mapped and identified. But don't expect anything fancy. Most of the time it's tassels from pots, pieces of badly corroded metal, and other rather unspectacular seeming objects. Yet through the precise mapping and identification of objects, archaeological sites can be identified, which can later be dug out by archaeologists. So finding treasures, while rare, is not unheard of. As noted, it happens often enough that regulating it was deemed to be necessary. And, as we have seen, the practice of burying things for whatever reason means that there are indeed things to be found. Found treasures were already regulated in Roman law, which is the foundation of many modern legal systems. In Roman law, found treasures could be kept if found on one's own land. If found on another person's land, the treasure had to be shared between the landowner and the finder. This might explain the behavior of the man in Jesus' parable of the hidden treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hidden fields. The which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. The man didn't want to share the treasure with the owner of the field, so he hid his discovery and bought the field to be the sole beneficiary of the treasure. In later times in Europe, found treasures would usually go to the owner of the land. In Europe's feudal system, this meant either the monarch or the nobility who owned the lands, that is, the landlord. Nowadays, laws vary greatly. In the USA, the finder of a treasure has a good claim to it, only the original owner has a better claim. But in reality, it can get very complicated with many parties involved with conflicting claims. In the US legal system, nothing is ever easy. Certain states use Old English common law, which includes the treasure trove law. But the application of the English treasure trove law is piecemeal and conflicting. Another applicable law is that for mislaid items. This law has the aim to bring together a person or their descendant with their lost property. However, this law is not really suited for archaeological artifacts, as they are so old that making a connection between a person hundreds of years ago to the present landowner is usually a bit of a stretch. In any case, as Archaeology Magazine explains, law in 
the United States has evolved towards granting the landowner the right to found objects on their property to the detriment of the finder, stating, By rejecting treasure trove and similar finders' rationales, those courts have fostered legal policies that discourage wanton trespass to a real property and give protection to a landowner's possessory claims to any artifacts that have been so embedded in the land as to become a part of it. Rejection of the rules that reward finders at the expense of landowners also strengthens anti-looting provisions and discourages casual but potentially destructive unplanned searches. Indeed, removal of artifacts from the soil is now recognized in the majority of states, either as illegal severance of chattels, trespass, or theft. In the United Kingdom, treasure troves belong to the Crown, but surprisingly, finders are treated very well compared to other countries. In the United Kingdom, with the exception of Scotland, someone who finds a treasure has to bring it to the attention of the local coroner. Yep, the same person investigating deaths. They will then decide if the find is indeed to be deemed a treasure. Then the market value of the find will be determined by the Treasury Valuation Committee, a governmental institution. Museums can then buy the item. They will pay a reward to the finder that cannot exceed the set market value. If no museum wants to purchase the treasure, the finder may keep it and do as they please with it. In other words, museums get a preemptive right to purchase the treasure. The market value is above the amount an antique dealer would pay. As the antique dealer wants to resell items with a margin of profit at market value, they will pay an amount smaller than the market value. Therefore, selling an item directly at market value to a museum can potentially be more profitable to the finder, who skips the middleman and their profit margin. Compared to other countries, it is a very good arrangement for finders. However, failure to submit found treasure will earn heavy penalties. For example, in 2019, two men were sentenced to 10 and 8.5 and years of jail time, respectively, for not having reported a find from the Viking Age they made in 2015 with metal detectors. Most of the treasure was lost as the finders sold off many of the coins on the private market. The English law here is not applicable to Scotland. That said, treasures found in Scotland are also the property of the Crown. Nevertheless, the process of what happens when someone finds a treasure is not dissimilar to what happens in the rest of the UK. The find gets assessed by an agency called the Treasure Trove Unit at the National Museums of Scotland in Edinburgh. They assess the finds and send a report to the Queen's and Lord Treasurer's Remembrancer, a governmental office, in which they claim the Crown's right to treasure trove or bone of acacia. The latter is applicable to abandoned goods. The treasure then gets offered to museums. If they are interested in acquiring a treasure, they pay a reward to the finder. A notable difference to the situation in the rest of the the United Kingdom is that in Scotland, treasure trove law not only applies to coins and other objects made of precious metals. All kinds of artifacts can be deemed treasure in Scottish law. Moving on to Germany, they have laws called the Schatzregal that regulate what to do with treasure. In this case, all kinds of objects can be seen as treasures, fosseries, pottery tassels, and of course coins, jewelry, etc. It generally only applies to objects of scientific value. Every federal state has their own law that also regulates if a finder gets remuneration. Even though every state has their own law, contrasting with many other places, the gist is this. The state owns all treasures, and hardly any state will pay a reward for objects. Bavaria is the odd one in the Bunch and has no law regarding treasure troves at all. Now you may ask, why is the state so precious about owning these treasures? Why can't finders just do whatever they want with what they find? The answer is that there is a conflict of interest at play. The interests of finders in remuneration clash with a societal interest in research. Regulating what to do when artifacts are found is deemed as a necessity because found objects could be of great scientific value. A problem arises when amateur treasure hunters dig up archaeological sites on with metal detectors to find valuable artifacts like golden brooches or coins. Motives can be enrichment through the sale of artifacts or the thrill of finding a piece of history. This activity is highly damaging to archaeological sites to the point of making the sites worthless for research. To exemplify the problem in Germany, some ancient Celtic cities called Pydia have not been excavated by archaeologists yet. As archaeological technology is constantly evolving, some sites or sections of sites are deliberately kept untouched to leave something to future archaeologists to do research on with new methods. This is because once a site is excavated, some of the information is irreparably lost. It is a destructive and irreversible process. After all, when a hole is dug, it is impossible to put the excavated earth back in the hole in the exact way it was found. This is why archaeological digging involves painstakingly precise documentation of all the findings
settings and processes down to the very color of different layers of dirt. Another reason that known sites have not been dug out yet is also down to simple time and funding constraints. Treasure hunters with metal detectors loot those places of their metal items. Archaeologist Muller Karp says that one of the Epida in Hesia has been robbed of an estimated 50,000 metal items, leaving the site virtually metal free. Looting not only precludes scientific research on the objects themselves, the looting also causes disturbance in the soil, scrambling the traces that are still present. Furthermore, looters will often falsely claim the origin of artifacts to make a sale appear legal. This is the case in Germany, where treasure troves belong to the state in most federal states, but not Bavaria. Thus, objects are sold as originating from Bavaria on online selling platforms to make them appear like legal finds. Of course, obfuscating the true origin in this manner reduces its scientific value even more. The artifacts also lose scientific value by being extracted from the soil without proper archaeological documentation. Not only are the sites damaged, the artifacts themselves also lose some of their worth for science. Extracted from their context, in which layer of the earth they were found, the objects that could be found next to it, the exact positioning, etc. All of this information is important to an archaeologist. The problem of the looting of archaeological sites has become so prominent that ongoing archaeological digs are often kept as secret as possible and sometimes guarded to prevent looters using the opportunity to go snatch some stuff up under the cover of darkness from an already dug up site. As you can see, it is a difficult problem where the interests of landowners, finders, and the scientific community clash, given the complication and many nations and states in the world, needless to say, there is hardly a consensus from place to place in that law. That said, should you happen to find a buried treasure, the best place to find out the exact local law for free is probably your nearest public museum, whose officials often know the skinny on procedures and rules in the area. While it might come as a surprise to many, the whole if anyone can show just cause why this couple cannot lawfully be joined together in matrimony, let them speak now or forever hold their peace, well, it's actually a required part of the ceremony among certain church groups, unless special dispensation is made in those cases. So what happens if someone actually objects, and where does this part of the ceremony come from? As for the first question, in modern times, in the vast majority of cases, nothing would come of an objection here, though there are exceptions. For an example of where nothing is likely to occur, if someone were to object on the grounds of their undying love for one of those being wed, or because they didn't think a given person was suitable for the other, in all likelihood the ceremony would proceed without the person officiating the wedding, even acknowledging the objection. You see, a key part of that question is why this couple cannot lawfully be joined. Thus, if someone were to object, say, on the grounds that they had knowledge that one of those being married was already married, or perhaps the couple were too closely related, one of them was being forced into it against their will, some form of serious fraudulent misrepresentation by one of the betrothed was occurring, etc., then the minister in question would be required to stop the wedding right there and then and investigate the claim. Of course, in modern times, this is highly unlikely to ever occur, even when some version of this question is required because of the process in acquiring a marriage license in many countries and the extensive data officially kept on people. Thus, the various ways in which someone could object in a way the officiator of the wedding might have to look into, should there be a requirement in a given church, are already sorted out before the ceremony itself ever takes place. This all brings us around to where the whole speak now or forever hold your peace came from in the first place. As for the exact phraseology, this was popularized in the Christian's Book of Common Prayers in the Marriage Liturgy section, with the original version of the work popping up in the 16th century, with many versions created since, including most notably the 1662 version, which is the basis for most today. This work also helped popularize such other common phrases as till death do us part, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and peace in our time. As to the ultimate origin of this idea, it came about thanks to a few changes to marriage law within the Catholic Church in and around the 12th century. Essentially, biblical scholars of the day were attempting to figure out how to properly define what a marriage really was, when it started exactly, and what was required to make it happen. Many of these changes were made to try to make it easier for people to wed, which was deemed a good thing to keep people from sexual sin. This all culminated in Pope Alexander III decreeing that two people were married when they both declared such to one another in the present tense. If done in private, this created a clandestine marriage. The problem, of course, was that this allowed people who the church would not normally deem legally able to marry, given church rules, to get married anyway. This also allowed certain unscrupulous individuals to take advantage of, say, a buxom young lass by declaring his marriage to her privately and then denying he ever did so the morning after, or a variety of other situations like that. 
These were also problems that needed to be solved, leading to the 1215 Fourth Lateran Council, which, among other things, decreed we absolutely forbid clandestine marriages, and we forbid also that a priest presume to witness such. Wherefore, extending to other localities generally the particular custom that prevails in some, we decree that when marriages are to be contracted, they must be announced publicly in the churches by the priests during a suitable and fixed time, so that if legitimate impediments exist, they may be made known. Thus, the reading of bans, simply meaning proclamations, was born initially among Catholics and later spreading to certain other Christian groups. For three consecutive weeks during the Sunday services, the proposed marriage was announced, and it was asked that anyone in the community come forward if they knew of some good reason why the two people should not be allowed to marry. This would also be asked one final time whenever the actual wedding ceremony itself took place. As for the valid reasons that could be considered, this included the aforementioned things like if one person was being coerced or already married married, not old enough to marry, though if the parents themselves didn't object on this point, it could be overlooked, etc. It's also important to note here that just because no one spoke up, it didn't mean that the church might not annul the wedding after the fact if some new information came to light. It was just a way to try to lower the odds of something like that happening by polling the general public beforehand. While the bans and the question being posed during an actual wedding has long since stopped being a thing among many church groups, or at least it's become optional, particularly as civil laws governing marriages and pre-screening have more and more come to take precedent, they are still a requirement in a select few church groups anyway. For example, with the Church of England, the bans are still usually required, though this requirement can potentially be worked around in various ways, such as with the right set of circumstances, the common license procedure, or a superintendent registrar's certificate. If the marriage ultimately takes place without the bonds, the local bishop may, in that case, simply require some penance by the couple to cease the marriage being considered illicit in the eyes of the church. Not just for objections, however, the bonds also provide time slots for a church congregation to pray for the couple and function as an official announcement of the intention to marry, which is in part why they are still kept around in some church groups and generally seen as a good thing, despite the somewhat antiquated part about checking for any reason that the couple should not be allowed to marry. Imagine for a moment you're on a long overseas flight. Say, for example, flight SQ-22 between Singapore and New York, the longest regularly scheduled non-stop route in the world. Around halfway through this grueling 18-hour, 40-minute marathon, having run out of in-flight movies to watch and grown bored of the latest Dan Brown literary abomination you purchased at the airport to pass the time, your eyes begin to wander around the crowded cabin. This is when you see them sitting three rows ahead of you, your nemesis. Perhaps it's the romantic rival who stole the love of your life, the bully who humiliated you throughout high school, or the parking officer who keeps ticketing you. But whoever they are, there is not a person on earth you would rather see dead. Seething with murderous rage, you drop your eyes and stare at the in-flight map on the screen in front of you, watching in frustration as the tiny icon of the plane crawls at a snail's pace across the vast Pacific Ocean. But then, like a bolt from the blue, you're struck by a sudden and powerful realization. You know exactly what you must do. You rise from your seat, push past your neighbors who have been snoring loudly throughout the flight. You go past the flight attendants on their 15th pass with a cart full of overpriced sandwiches. And with the airline headphones you paid way too much for, you proceed to strangle your nemesis to death. Moments later, as the Sky Marshal tackles you to the ground, you can't help but smile. For you know that in a few hours, you will be walking away scot-free. After all, the murder you just committed took place not in any country's sovereign territory, but a metal tube hurtling 11,000 meters over international waters, illegal no man's land, where no one nation can claim jurisdiction. You have, for all intents and purposes, committed the perfect crime. Or have you? While pop culture would have us believe that the skies and the high seas are a lawless grey zone where one can commit all manner of heinous crimes without repercussions, the reality is far more complicated and ultimately rather disappointing. So please put down your weapons, hit lists, and sketches of the world's most badass pirate ship as we dive into the fascinating world of international law, extraterritorial jurisdiction, and crime outside of sovereign territory. Ever since humans began sailing the world's oceans, tension has existed between between two basic desires, that of nations to defend their sovereign territory and that of merchant ships to sail the high seas unmolested. In order to reconcile these competing interests, over the years, a series of international maritime laws have been developed based on the principles of mare liberum, or freedom of the seas. First formally outlined in 1608 by Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius, these laws were most recently codified in 1982 by the Third United Nations Convention on the Law of the 
PC or Unclos 3. At its most basic, the principle of Mare Liberum holds that a nation only has the sovereign jurisdiction over those waters it can practically police. That is, all lakes, rivers, and other bodies of water contained within its borders, and a narrow strip of ocean extending a certain distance from its coastline. These are what are known as territorial waters. At first, this limit was set at 3 nautical miles, equivalent to 1.51 statute miles or 1.85 kilometers. This was the maximum range that a cannon of the era could fire with any accuracy. In more recent years, the limit has been extended to 12 nautical miles, so that today only the Kingdom of Jordan and a few British overseas territories like Gibraltar still use the old three-mile limit, while certain countries, including the United States, set the boundary of their territorial waters at 24 nautical miles from shore. But wherever the boundary is set, vessels passing through a nation's internal and territorial waters are subject at all times to that nation's laws. In addition to territorial waters, UNCLOS 3 grants each nation a further 12-mile area known as the contiguous zone. A nation may stop, search, and detain any vessel in the contiguous zone engaging in activities which currently or may soon threaten said nation's security or violate its customs, immigration, or environmental laws such as espionage, smuggling, piracy, or illegal dumping. For this reason, the contiguous zone is also sometimes referred to as the hot pursuit zone. Coastal nations, which depend on maritime natural resources such as fishing or oil and natural gas extraction, are further granted a further area known as the exclusive economic zone, defined as the area 200 nautical miles beyond the contiguous zone or the extent of that nation's portion of the continental shelf, whichever is greater. Within this zone, a nation may stop, search, and detain vessels infringing on its fishing or mineral rights, but must grant all other as free passage. While these rules might seem straightforward, given the complex nature of the Earth's geography, conflicts and exceptions will inevitably arise. For example, in nations made up of multiple islands like Indonesia and the Philippines, the 12-mile territorial zones of each island will often overlap, meaning that under the conventional definition, all passages within the archipelago would be classified as internal waters subject to that nation's full sovereignty and jurisdiction. However, blocking access to these waters and forcing all vessels to sail around the archipelago would overlap disrupt freedom of international shipping. Therefore, international maritime law recognizes the principle of innocent passage, the freedom of a vessel to pass through a nation's internal waters so long as it's not carrying weapons or other military equipment, engaging in fishing or mineral extraction, or any other activities in violation of said nation's security, resource rights, or laws. By international agreements, several other internal waterways have also been declared international shipping routes, including the Danish Straits between the Atlantic Ocean and the Baltic Sea, and the Dardanelles and Bosphorus Straits between the Mediterranean and Black Seas, and the Danube River, which connects Germany, Croatia, Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, Serbia, and Moldova to the Black Sea. For our purposes, however, what we're interested in is the area beyond a nation's territorial waters, contiguous zone, and exclusive economic zone. The area, known variously as the Mare Liberum, the high seas or international waters, over which, according to international maritime law, no nation may claim sovereignty or legal jurisdiction. But before you invite your romantic rival on a spontaneous deep sea fishing trip exactly 225 nautical miles offshore, it is important to point out that while Mare Liberum is commonly understood to mean that the high seas belong to no one, the more accurate interpretation is that they belong to everyone. This effectively means that any crime committed on the high seas is a crime against the principle of Mare Liberum and thus the global community as a whole, and that any nation can then intervene to stop or prosecute said crime. To understand what all of that means, imagine for a moment that you've decided to live out your childhood dream of becoming a pirate. You cash in your life savings, you buy a ship, you hire a crew of scurvy sea dogs, you hoist the Jolly Roger, and you set off for a life of plunder on the high seas. If you commit an act of smuggling or other crime within a nation's internal or territorial waters or its contiguous zone, you will of course be subject to that nation's laws and all the attendant penalties. Being a very smart pirate, however, you carefully limit your boarding and pillaging to the high seas far out outside the jurisdiction of any sovereign nation. So this means you're home free, right? Ah, uh, well, alas, no, for according to the principle of port state jurisdiction, the last port you sailed from, or the next port you will sail into, will have legal jurisdiction over any criminal act committed on the high seas. But aha! I hear you say. Then I just won't put into any port. I'll stay safely in international waters, resupply myself by a small boat or seaplane. Surely nobody can touch me now. Again. 
No. For while the waters you are floating on belong to no one nation, the vessel you are sailing in most certainly does. According to international maritime law, all vessels must be registered in some sovereign territory and are thus subject to the laws of that territory, a principle known as flag state jurisdiction. Thus, if your pirate ship is registered in the UK, any crimes you commit can now be prosecuted under UK law, no matter where on earth they are committed. In order to cut down on costs, many shipping companies will register their vessels in nations with laxer labor and tax laws, a practice known as flying a flag of convenience. This is why nearly 40% of commercial vessels operating today are registered in Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands. Fine! Fine, 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 I hear you say. Then I won't fly any flag other than my beloved Jolly Roger. Let's see them stop me now. Well, once again, you're out of luck. For under international maritime law, an unregistered vessel not flying any flag is automatically deemed suspicious and is subject to search and detainment by vessels of any nation that happen to be passing by. That if you happen to engage in activities which violate international law, such as slavery, torture, crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, illegal broadcasting, and yeah piracy, then you will be subject to universal jurisdiction which grants any nation the right to try and prosecute such crimes. Currently, 163 out of 193 UN member states are able to exercise universal jurisdiction over one or more crimes under international law, either as such crimes or as ordinary crimes under national law. And if for some reason the nation which detains you chooses not to try your case, then in most cases your nation of citizenship will be more than happy to oblige. According to the principle of extraterritorial jurisdiction, a nation's legal jurisdiction may be extended beyond its sovereign territory if a, a crime is committed outside its territory but has effects within its borders, b, the crime violates international law according to the principle of universal jurisdiction, and c, the crime is committed by one of its own citizens. But before you try and run off and renounce your citizenship, destroy all of your personal records, and burn off your fingerprints in order to become an ungovernable international man of mystery, just know that if somehow your citizenship cannot be determined, then you will likely just be handed off to your victim's country of origin. While it pains us here at Today found out to crush your dreams of freedom and adventure on the high seas, the disappointing truth is that no matter how vast or lawless the oceans might appear, thanks to international maritime law, there is no place on earth where you can commit crimes with impunity. So, you'd be better off hanging up the eye patch and sticking to your day job in accounts receivable. At least it's got a dental plan. But Simon... You're probably now yelling at the screen. What about the skies? Surely nobody could police the skies, Simon! Well, alas, alas, the news for any would-be sky pirates is just as bleak as for their water-brown cousins. For according to international law, the boundaries of territorial and international waters are not limited to the surface of the ocean, but also extend downward to the ocean floor and upwards to the edge of outer space, which is itself treated more or less like international waters. This means that no, you cannot get around international maritime law by operating a pirate submarine, and that crime aboard an aircraft or a spacecraft is dealt with in much the same way as crime aboard a regular surface vessel. That aircraft in the skies are treated similarly to ships at sea should come as no surprise. After all, the addition of the third dimension changes almost nothing, legally speaking. Aircraft, like ships, are required to be registered in a sovereign nation, travel between airports located within sovereign nations and carry passengers who, under the principle of extraterritorial jurisdiction, are subject to the legal jurisdiction of their home countries. Thus, all the old principles of international maritime law still apply. Nonetheless, international agreements have been drafted to cover the particulars of crime aboard commercial aircraft, the most recent being the UN Convention on Offences and certain other acts committed on board aircraft signed into law in Tokyo in 1963. According to Article 4 of the Convention, any crime committed aboard a commercial flight falls under the jurisdiction of the nation in which that aircraft is registered and, to quote, a contracting state which is not the state of registration may not interfere with an aircraft in flight in order to exercise exercise its criminal jurisdiction over an offence committed on board except in the following cases. The offence has been committed by or against a national or permanent resident of such state. The offence is against the security of such state. The offence consists of a 
breach of any rules and regulations relating to the flight or maneuver of an aircraft in force in such state, the exercise of jurisdiction is necessary to ensure the observance of any obligation of such state under a multilateral international agreement. Articles 5 to 10 of the convention also state that ultimate legal authority aboard an aircraft in flight is held by the aircraft's commander, who, to quote, when he had reasonable grounds to believe that a person has committed or is about to commit on board the aircraft an offense or act contemplated in Article 1, Paragraph 1, impose upon such person reasonable measures, including restraints, which are necessary to protect the safety of the aircraft or of persons or property therein, or to maintain good order and discipline on board, or to enable him to deliver such person to competent authorities or to disembark him in accordance with the provisions of this chapter. In extreme circumstances such as a terrorist hijacking, the convention further extends these powers to anyone aboard the aircraft, including passengers who are permitted to take reasonable measures to prevent the commission of a crime without having to ask permission or face legal repercussions. However, the provisions of the Tokyo Convention only apply when an aircraft crosses international borders or flies over international waters, with the aircraft considered to be in flight. Quote, from the moment when power is applied for the purpose of takeoff until the moment when the landing run ends. Outside of this period, and for domestic flights taking place entirely within the borders of the aircraft's state of registration, crimes committed aboard the aircraft fall under the legal jurisdiction of said state, with the prosecution of aerial crimes varying from nation to nation. In the United States, for example, under the 1974 Anti-Hijacking Act, the commission of a crime aboard an aircraft in flight over U.S. territory is a federal offense covered under Title 49 of the U.S. Code of federal regulations and prosecuted under the authority of the Federal Aviation Authority or FAA. The only exception is when an aircraft is on the ground prior with its doors still open, in which case jurisdiction passes to the U.S. state in which the aircraft is located. As federal crimes are subject to strict sentencing guidelines, this means that committing a crime aboard an airliner can net you a much harsher sentence than committing the same crime on the ground. So if you're planning to steal some duty-free liquor, do it at the airport. Laws like the Tokyo Convention and the Anti-Hijacking Act did much to resolve the legal ambiguity that plagued the airline industry in the years prior to their introduction, an ambiguity that is perfectly summed up by the 1949 case of United States and Cordova. On the 2nd of August 1948, a brawl broke out between two passengers aboard a Douglas DC-4 airliner bound from San Juan, Puerto Rico to New York City. The passengers in question had been drinking heavily since the flight began and had gotten into an argument over a missing bottle of rum. When the pilot and a flight attendant attempted to break up the fight, however, they were assaulted by one of the brawling passengers, one Mr. Cordova, who bit the pilot and struck the flight attendant. The crew eventually managed to lock up Cordova in a rear compartment and, once the plane had landed, and delivered him into the custody of the New York District. As the assault had taken place over international waters well outside the jurisdiction of the state of New York, the case was brought before a federal court. However, at the time, U.S. federal law did not recognize an aircraft in flight as a vessel under international maritime law, nor did it include any provisions for extending federal jurisdiction to crimes committed over international waters. In light of these legal gaps, the presiding judge refused to prosecute the case, and Mr. Cordova walked away a free man. If the same were tried today under Title 49, the FAA would be able to claim complete jurisdiction over the case on the grounds that a the aircraft was registered in the United States, B, the flight both originated from and terminated at an airport on U.S. territory, and C, as a resident of Puerto Rico, Mr. Cordova was, according to the Nationality Act of 1940, a U.S. citizen. So, to all you would-be DB Coopers out there, just know that when it comes to federal and international law, the sky is definitely not the limit. In 2005, a homeless man called Ted Rodrigue stumbled upon a briefcase filled with crisp $20 and $50 bills, totaling $100,000, which is about $123,000 today. Ted was then told by screenwriter Wayne Powers that the money was to keep and do with as he wished, so long as he would allow a film crew to document the result. Rodrigue, understandably, jumped at the opportunity, leading to a somewhat controversial documentary, which was called Reversal of Fortune. According to Powers, the genesis of this documentary stemmed from his time in LA, where he was frequently asked for money by the homeless, prompting him to ponder, what would a homeless person do if I gave them a million dollars? Powers was curious if such a substantial amount of money could change a person's life for the better, or if it'd simply make it worse. He took the idea to an executive at Showtime, where he'd briefly written a short-lived series called Out of Order. 
The executives loved the idea, but weren't exactly thrilled at the idea of paying out a million dollars, eventually talking powers down to $100,000. With funding in hand, all powers needed was a homeless person to give the money to. According to him, he picked Ted after filming several conversations with him and coming to the conclusion that Ted was a man who'd been dealt a bad hand and deserved a break for once. As Ted put it, when I look back at my childhood, I think it was screwed up. My mother was an alcoholic. We used to have parties all the time at the house. We used to, as kids, sneak in and grab a beer. Sometimes they'd even give us one. I started drinking. I've been drinking since about 13. After he moved away from home, he noted, basically, I spent my 20s in prison, and that's when it really seems like nobody gave a shit anymore. When I got out of prison, I got no help from anybody. That's when I started to learn to survive on the streets myself. If I could have my dream, I'd just live in a society like a regular citizen, but I don't see it happening. It's too easy for me to say, to hell with it, because I know how to survive out there. If things don't go my way or I get pissed off at a boss, it's too easy for me to say, to hell with you, and move on, because that's what I've done all my life. Mostly homeless for about two decades when filming began, the then 45-year-old Rodrigue survived by collecting cans and bottles. On an average day, he noted he could make about $20 or so doing this, enough for himself to buy food, alcohol, and cigarettes. On a good day, he could sometimes earn as much as $35. Despite his homelessness, Ted revealed that he was relatively happy. I kind of like recycling because I don't have anybody telling me what to do. I go do it when I want, quit when I want, take a break when I want. I have nobody to answer to. If I choose not to go out today, if I just want to sit in the park, I can do that. He even had a prized possession in the form of a bicycle, which he lovingly cleaned on a weekly basis at a car wash, much more rigorous cleaning than he afforded his own body. According to the documentary, prior to his windfall, Ted's only real friend was a young man called Mike who worked at his local recycling plant. Ted noted he considered Mike something of a son. Whether the feeling was mutual or not isn't clear from the documentary, though Mike did seem genuinely friendly towards Ted. Besides alcohol and cigarettes, Ted avoided drugs due to bad experiences that he'd had with them earlier in his life. I've used every drug there is. I see what it does to people. You get scandalous. I started breaking into people's houses. You steal from your friends. After passing a drug test to prove that he was drug-free and undergoing psychiatric screening, Ted seemed like the ideal candidate for Powers' little experiment. After the screening was done, Powers and the rest of the film crew, rather than simply giving Ted the money, chose instead to hide it in a dumpster they knew that he frequently searched for cans and bottles in. Presumably, because originality is a scarce resource, they chose to hide the money inside of a nondescript briefcase with a note reading, what would a homeless person do if he were given $100,000? Upon finding the briefcase, Ted, showing remarkable restraint, immediately thought about leaving it behind, Riley quipping in a later interview, I thought I was going to get shot. I thought it was drug money. Then I thought it was a prop for the movie, and I would have to give it back. Once he was reassured by the filmmakers that the money was his to do with as he liked, the gravity of his cash windfall finally struck home. From this moment on, the filmmakers didn't interfere with Ted's life or his spending in any way, merely observing and documenting his day-to-day -day life. They did, however, give Ted access to a financial advisor whose advice he was free to solicit or ignore or as he chose. So, what was the result of all of this? After a brief meeting with the financial advisor, Ted bought himself a new bicycle and took him and his friend Mike to an amusement park. Following this, Ted rented a room in a motel, but due to years of sleeping rough, he found it hard to adjust and ended up sleeping on the floor. As you can see, up until this point, Ted's financial decisions were reasonably restrained and probably not too dissimilar to what any of us would do. But what happens shortly after this resembles what happens to many big-ticket lottery winners, one third of which go bankrupt within five years, most of which subsequently suffer social problems and often depression, even if they are sensible with their money, and occasionally they even get murdered by former friends and family. Luckily, Ted avoided the third of these gruesome outcomes. As financial advisor Shrifa Burke says, For many people who come into wealth suddenly, whether they win the lottery, receive an insurance settlement, or an unexpected inheritance, if they have not acquired good money skills prior to this windfall, often they struggle and make poor choices. Interestingly, those who get the money and then decide to start a business with it rather than just blow the money are often no better off than those who just spent the money on hookers and blow. For more information on the reality of winning the lottery, you can find a link to a video we've done on that in the description below. So in this case, what specifically happened to Ted? Soon after finding the money, news of Ted's wealth spread to his associates in the homeless community who came to ask him for help. Being a generally nice guy, Ted kindly obliged, paying off many of his friends' debts and providing for them financially. Around this time, Ted also met a woman who magically became attracted to him the moment she found out it acquired $100,000. And she certainly wasn't the only one. The women were just flocking all over. I'd walk out of the bar just to get away from everything, and they'd just follow me out. It's not about me. It's about the money. I know that. I'm not fucking stupid. 
It was at this point that Ted adopted the policy of, as he put it, bang em and leave em. Though he did spend lavishly on the women as well, including buying one of them, who he would later marry, a car. He bought his young friend Mike a car as well, but he did not end up marrying him. Next up, Ted left Pasadena to visit his friends in Sacramento. Previous to his windfall, he had stated his mother had long since stopped talking to him and his relationship with his sisters was somewhat strained. However, unlike most people in Ted's life at this point, his family, at least as far as the footage shows, showed genuine concern for his well-being. And rather than just asking him for any money, they invited him to stay with them in Sacramento and encouraged him to save the money and get a job. His sisters even made phone calls on his behalf to find him work doing something that he liked. But Ted didn't appreciate their efforts, not liking them trying to meddle with his life. He brushed off their concern and even refused to continue meeting with his financial advisor, believing that he just wanted his money like everyone else. Speaking of which, it was eventually revealed that Ted wasn't interested in finding work as he believed, or at least he said, that he thought $100,000 was enough money to live the rest of his life. This, he said, after buying a $34,000 truck and spending several more thousand dollars renting and lavishly furnishing a luxury apartment. This said, the documentary shows that while Ted is perhaps quite undereducated, he's certainly no idiot, and it's more likely that this was just talk and he knew well that the money wouldn't last forever, but having lived so much of his life day to day, never thinking about tomorrow, as he said, because I know how to survive out here, he perhaps wasn't at all concerned that he was going to end up back on the street if he didn't find a job. Instead, he seemed focused on enjoying the moment, as he had for pretty much his whole life. Once again, this may all seem amazingly short-sighted and even moronic of Ted, but if big-ticket lottery winners or others who suddenly come into a lot of money are any indication, even the most intelligent and previously financially stable of people tend to do pretty much the same thing, spend it wildly on themselves and everyone they know until it's not only all gone, but generally they'll continue from there and drive themselves into massive debt. In the case of big-ticket lotto winners, this all happens despite likewise being given a consultation with a financial advisor who specializes in helping lotto winners and who advises them against the pitfalls that befall many in their situation. And as for those who spend frugally and save the rest, not giving any away to friends and family, according to the Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, many end up ostracized from their loved ones over their unwillingness to share and have a much higher risk of suffering from depression, drug abuse, divorce, and suicide than many of their peers. This has led to the dark joke among those who work at the Board of Standards, if you really hate someone, buy them a lottery ticket. As Ted summed it up, you never think that the money's going to run out sooner or later. A mere few months after Ted was given the $100,000, the filmmakers became concerned with how much of the money Ted had left, causing Ted to become more paranoid about his financial situation and ceasing to share his bank statements with them. About a year later, Ted appeared on Oprah in an episode entitled, Are You Ready for a Windfall?, that dealt with various individuals who had acquired massive amounts of money very quickly, whether by winning, being given, or earning it by their own hard work, with the overarching connection being that all of them went from meager means to great means overnight. In the cases of those who appeared on the show, they saw their lives go on a downward spiral because of the windfall. It was on this episode that Ted sheepishly revealed that he'd spent or given away all $100,000 within six to eight months of receiving it, and that he was, once again, homeless. Curiously, Ted appeared resentful about the whole thing and expressed that, while not happy with the situation, he was at least very content to once again be homeless and back where he started. It should also be noted that as soon as the money ran out, Ted's marriage fell apart, and all of the friends he'd made and helped abandoned him. He did not mention whether his one former friend, Mike, who had bought a car, had also left. To top it off, due to his splurging, Ted revealed that he was now in debt, though he did not specify by how much. Ted's current whereabouts and situation aren't known. The most recent update we could find on him is from 2007, two years after the documentary. At this point, he was still homeless and recycling cans and bottles for money. Powers noted of all of this, It was a frustrating process, in a way, because I think that there were a lot of opportunities sent Ted's way. And while you're with someone, and the closer you get to someone, and the more that you kind of root for them and understand them, the more frustrating it gets when those opportunities are passed by. I think that it shows from a personal story, people that are homeless, there are certain demons inside them. I think alcoholism plays a part of that. I learned that in providing somebody with the necessities to be able to turn their life around, a car, a telephone, a roof above their head, a driver's license, all the things that we hear is what somebody needs to be able to turn their life around, it still, unfortunately, in this particular case, was not enough. So, to answer the question of what happens when you give a more or less drug-free, reasonably psychologically sound homeless person $100,000, pretty much the exact same thing that often happens when you suddenly give a non-homeless person a relative fortune compared to what they're used to. As with many big-ticket lotto winners, they often end up worse off or in the same state as before they got the cash, perhaps with a little depression added in for good measure, something of a Flowers of Algonon effect. 
Cemeteries are just like any other business. They need to make money in order to stay open. However, unlike other businesses, cemeteries, particularly ones in heavily populated areas, can only operate for so long before they run out of their main product, usable space to put bodies in. The people who buy a burial plot generally purchase the land once and then never move out. So how do cemeteries keep themselves from going under, and what happens when they run out of money? For starters, one option for extending the life of the cemetery is to use every square inch possible, even many former walkways. For instance, the Karakata Cemetery in Perth, Australia, operates a renewal program that creates new burial plots in the narrow spaces between existing graves. For a cemetery that opened in 1899 and is otherwise full up, the renewal program has allowed Karakata Cemetery to stay in business. Without the program, cemetery management claims they would have had to stop accepting new burials in 2004. Another practice used by cemeteries to increase the business lifespan is reusing burial plots. The practice works more like a lease on the burial plot as opposed to a purchase. This sort of thing is common in places like Germany, Australia, and New Zealand. Once the lease is up, the usual practice is to cremate any remains once the occupant has been evicted from their grave. Other cemeteries, such as those managed by the Church of England, use a dig and deepen strategy, creating multi-storied graveyards. Workers exhume the remains before reburying them at a greater depth in the same burial plot. This leaves room for another person to be buried above them. Yet another strategy to get around the fact that eventually a cemetery will fill up but still need money to operate is for a portion of the money that people pay for the burial plot to go into a perpetual care fund. Wisely invested, this funds can provide quite a bit of money for the long term, which means the cemetery can then use it to pay groundskeepers to cut the grass, trim any bushes or hedges, and generally maintain the appearance of the cemetery. Many cemeteries are non-profit, so avoid needing to pay expensive taxes. However, if the perpetual care fund runs out, or if there never was one to begin with, and if the cemetery is full up with no further way to generate enough revenue to keep the business open, the cemetery may ultimately go bankrupt or otherwise be closed down or abandoned. If the process of a foreclosure or a bankruptcy starts, the rest of the operations at the cemetery screech to a halt. So the maintenance of the grounds, the burial of individuals who prepay for their plots and other day-to-day -day goings on stop while the courts and banks work out what will happen next to the business and land. Families and friends of those who prepaid for their burial end up faced with a difficult decision. They can wait for the bankruptcy or foreclosure issue to be resolved, find and purchase a new burial plot elsewhere, or if the courts allow it, hire someone with the machinery to dig the grave in the plot they already paid for. Care of loved ones' graves also falls to them during that time. From here, what happens next varies widely on a case-by-case -case basis. In the case of a cemetery foreclosure or complete abandonment, sometimes the local municipality will simply take over control and management of the land. In other cases, the current owner of the cemetery, which is no longer economically viable, may seek permission from their local municipality to sell or repurpose the land for commercial or home use. As you might imagine, this is a dicey proposition, and the rules governing the legality of this vary greatly from region to region. One place where it can be more of an issue than others is in the United States, where burial plot rights are somewhat uniquely generally considered perpetual, including passing on to the relatives of the deceased who have the right to visit and maintain the gravesite of their loved one whenever they please, and potentially for all of time. If someone were to, for instance, buy the property and build a house or houses over the graveyard, that would potentially infringe upon that right. However, the courts may decide that the relatives had previously abandoned the particular grave, or may otherwise decide to grant a sale or repurposing of the land anyway. For instance, it may be decided that it's in the best interests of a given community to grant such permission, despite any objections from those who have loved ones buried in the cemetery in question. So, in the end, repurposing land that was once an active graveyard usually requires jumping over a lot of legal hurdles. To get approval, the municipality may require, as part of a sale or repurposing agreement, that all the graves be moved to another suitable location first. 
However, if the graveyard has been fully abandoned by everyone, including all the descendants of those buried there, and is not considered a historic gravesite, the courts may grant the right for the owner of the property to sell or use the property for other things, like a subdivision, without needing to remove the bodies. In these cases, it generally falls to the relatives of the deceased to move the remains before construction starts, if they so choose. All that said, as you might imagine, particularly in cases where houses are being built over former cemeteries, the real estate investors purchasing the land may well simply pay to have the graves moved first, as leaving the bodies often significantly cuts down on the ultimate sale prices of the homes built on top of them. Okay, so we've all heard the story of Jonah being swallowed by the whale, and then, along with his father Geppetto, creating a fire so that the whale sneezes them out, or, you know, something like that. The Bible is weird. Is that, is that a Bible story? There is a band called Noah and the Whale. Um, they're actually pretty good, but they come up. Noah, whale, story. Yeah, it's in the Book of Jonah. I didn't even know there was a Book of Jonah. Who cares? It's all crazy. Whatever the case, being swallowed whole is a fate that has permeated our mythology and stories throughout time. But what is the actual typical progression to death when an animal gets swallowed whole? And are there any animals outside of more commonly known things like tapeworms that occasionally survive the ordeal and go along their merry way, whether by fighting their way out or simply being pushed out at the other end? As you might expect, death for creatures swallowed whole depends on what creatures eat them. Some of the most famous animals known for swallowing prey whole, snakes, actually kill their prey before consuming it, either through venom or constriction. However, in some instances, certain animals take their prey directly into their mouths while the creature is still alive and kicking. Such creatures include frogs, certain fish and birds, varieties of snake, and even people. We're looking at you, goldfish swallowing college students. One especially creepy example of a creature that eats its prey whole is the Kinabalu giant red leech. This large animal, a tiny Lovecraftian horror, preys on a species of giant earthworm native to the jungles of Borneo and sucks the whole thing into its mouth like a giant piece of spaghetti, being eaten apparently by another giant piece of spaghetti. While there is some contention among experts, it appears that these worms are swallowed alive, as there have been instances of the leeches having to spit out worms whose size they underestimated, after which point the worm goes on its wiggly way. So what happens to them once inside? It is generally thought the worms die relatively quickly, since the stifling confines of the leech's body aren't exactly ideal for the worm's respiration, causing it to suffocate long before it's converted into leech dookie. In some examples, such as with certain birds, the predator may attempt to stun or incapacitate its prey with its mouth parts before swallowing, though this may simply result in debilitating injuries rather than death. A conscious trip to the stomach is also a legitimate possibility in the case of things like frogs and fish, which commonly push their food to the back of their mouths with little or no injury before swallowing. So, supposing an animal's prey survives its foray into the mouth of its predator, what happens to it next? While some might claim the strong contract actions of the predator's esophagus is enough to crush the animal, anyone who's thrown up and seen a fully intact french fry from lunch can attest that esophageal contractions are seldom strong enough to crush food, only strong enough to encourage its trip down to the stomach. Once in the stomach, while the most obvious cause of death for animals swallowed alive would be the powerful stomach acid of a predator, it's generally unlikely that this is going to cause the death, at least not in the flesh-melting way occasionally mentioned in Hollywood. Rather, thanks to sphincters, everyone's favorite variety of muscle, the interior of a stomach is largely bereft of breathable air. I, I have to say, this is the first thing I think of. Like, I imagine being swallowed by some huge sort of creature. I don't think I'm going to die in acid. I'm going to be like, there's not going to be a lot of air in there, is there? Thus, such an environment would likely cause an air-breathing animal to pass out and die relatively quickly. By contrast, it would take much longer for stomach acid to eat through the skin or outer surface to the point where it would do any life-threatening damage. Even in the case of fish being swallowed alive, the high acid, low oxygen content of the stomach acid and chyme present in the predator's digestive tract would likewise cause it to perish from suffocation fairly quickly. Of course, the next question that's bound to arise when considering this morbid issue is, outside of obvious Creatures like certain parasites, can other creatures feasibly survive being swallowed alive? 
Well, it turns out, yes. As an example, some snails have been known to make the long and undignified journey through an animal's entire digestive tract and come out Shawshank Redemption style on the other end. For example, the Tornatellides boninginghi snail of Japan's Hayajima Island are known to have a small chance of surviving an entire trip through a bird's digestive system after being eaten. We like to imagine this process leaves the snail's shell with a shiny new buff job, though it probably never smells quite the same again. As to how often they survive, Shinokiru Wada and his colleagues at Tohoku University found that when these snails were fed to bird species native to Hayajima Island, about 15% of them survived the trip, with one of them even giving birth after the journey. As for the exact mechanism that allows the snails to survive the trek down the bird's bowels, this isn't clear. However, the researchers theorize the snail's shell, coupled with an ability to seal itself in with a powerful coating of mucus called an epiphram, prevents stomach acid from touching the snail. Additionally, the gastropod's small size ensures that it encounters minimal complications, such as being crushed as it makes its stinky journey. It's even hypothesized that this mechanism might even be an element of the snail's evolution, allowing it to propagate its species about the island via handy transportation inside birds. Scientists have seen similar phenomena in pond snails eaten by fishes and birds. So what about other creatures? Well, in 2012, biologists in East Timor observed a strange worm-like species of snake, known as a blind snake, emerging from the rear end of a toad. As to how the snake survives such an event, the researchers hypothesized this is due to the creature's overlapping scales, which made it resistant to damage. Its worm-like shape, which allowed it to crawl through the toad's bowels, the fact that the toad hadn't eaten recently, leaving a nice poop-free intestine for the snake to climb through, and finally, the blind snake's ability to thrive underground with only minimal oxygen. All that said, unfortunately, the intrepid blind snake died several hours after its triumphant emergence, though it wasn't really clear why. Moving on from there, what about animals that perhaps attempt at least to fight their way out? While most creatures have the sense not to swallow anything alive that has sharp spines, claws, or toxins, it just so happens that there is a kind of creature in which such a scenario has played out multiple times in the past. Enter the snake eel. The snake eel has a barbed tail, which it uses to burrow in the sand. However, when eaten by a fish, it has been observed to use this tail to attempt to bore through the stomach of the animal that ate it. Lovely. However, as far as researchers can tell, these attempts always end up in vain, as the eel inevitably finds itself trapped in the space between the stomach and the abdominal wall, where it often suffocates, though does at least get a little revenge on its killer. Generally, however, such snafus are avoided by the evolutionary instincts of the predator in question. When it comes to the highest evolved of animals, however, that animal's greatest asset, personality, and free thought sometimes override this safeguard. And of course, this is where Dolph... <laughs> Humans enter the picture. For example, in 2016, a drunk man from the Netherlands was coaxed into swallowing a live catfish. Now, for those not acquainted with catfish anatomy, these creatures have sharp spines on their pectoral fins, and in some species, these spines can be quite venomous, used in self-defense scenarios, such as being swallowed by an inebriated Dutchman. The fish ended up getting lodged in his throat, and he was rushed to intensive care, vomiting blood, where the catfish was subsequently and safely removed. The man lived to experience further part and perhaps swallow other creatures. The fish, however, while successfully achieving its goal of extraction, wasn't so lucky. Despite its valiant efforts to carve its way from the innards of the beast that consumed it, it perished in the fight, likely due to lack of oxygen or being drowned in cheap Dutch beer. But have there ever been any happy endings where an animal has safely fought its way out? Well, yes. One such feat of daring do has been observed from the Bombardier beetle. These critters have the ability to release a burst of highly irritating chemicals that shoot from their insectoid moneymakers with extremely high pressure. You might recall how earlier we mentioned that some frogs tend to swallow prey without incapacitating it first. Well, Shingi Sugiura and Takuya Sato, researchers at Kobe University, observed instances of frogs consuming the beetles, after which point the beetles' defensive mechanisms, once applied from the confines of the frog's stomach, would cause the the amphibians to regurgitate the beetle. The beetle, in spite of its trip to the gastric Hilton, generally remained unharmed after the ordeal. Even more impressive is the rough-skinned newt, an amphibian that produces a powerful toxin that has the potential to kill any predators foolish enough to ignore the newt's cautionary orange coloring. The newt's poison is so powerful, in fact, that frogs have been observed swallowing the critter, then succumbing to the toxin so quickly that the newt has time to exit through the frog's mouth before the predator's digestive juices and lack of oxygen take 
take effect. Moving on from there, the Apomis beetle larva has been known to take things a step further. In fact, this beetle and its nightmarish offspring are known as frog hunters. So how does a tiny invertebrate hunt down and slowly eat alive a creature many times its size? In short, the larvae have a tactic of dodging the frog's tongue before being swallowed, then latching onto the creature where they proceed to devour it. In at least one instance, however, the frog actually succeeded in consuming the larva, whereupon it was regurgitated. At this point, the food turned on its dinner, grabbed it with its mandibles, and proceeded to feed, thus not only surviving the events, but ultimately consuming the creature that swallowed it. But let's go back to the beginning and talk about Jonah and Pinocchio. But are there any animals that can swallow people whole and alive? Although there have been some very rare instances of snakes swallowing people, such reptiles have a means of incapacitating you first, mainly through constriction, so you'd be dead before being swallowed, especially considering that the swallowing process in such cases would likely take hours or longer. Crocodiles and sharks, again, rarely consume people, and in such cases the prey would be dead first by being ripped apart or significant damage being done by the predator's powerful teeth and jaws. This leaves whales as the only candidate for swallowing people alive. However, the largest animals on the planet, the blue whale, along with the largest fish, the whale shark, are not equipped to swallow humans, having tiny esophagi which would cause them to choke on us. That leaves the sperm whale the largest carnivorous cetacean. And some experts claim that it may theoretically be possible for a sperm whale to swallow a person whole, though there are two problems with this. One is that the sperm whale's dagger-like teeth would likely kill the prey first, in which case you'd be long dead before suffocating in the whale's several stomachs. But this point is rendered mostly null as sperm whales only feed deep beneath the surface of the water and would never view humans as prey. So any accidental swallowing would have to derive from a rather bizarre sequence of events. That said, there is a commonly told story of one James Bartley being swallowed by a sperm whale in the late 1800s, after which he was cut out of the whale by fellow mariners apparently many hours later. Though his skin had supposedly been bleached white and his eyes rendered blind, he allegedly survived. However, in more recent times, most find this story a bit far-fetched, given the particulars, including the extreme amount of time Bartley supposedly spent in the whale's insides, among other issues with the tail. On top of that, there really isn't much of any hard evidence to indicate that this actually occurred, despite the story making the rounds back in the day. It's perhaps a bit akin to the legend of the dolphin Polaris Jack that was a worldwide sensation in his day, and even still widely credited today for something he never once actually did, and we did a whole video about that. On the plus side, humans can apparently take heart in the fact that among the multitudes of unpleasant ways we can die, we never have to worry about being swallowed alive, unless Cthulhu emerges from his sunken palace beneath the tides to once more begin his terrible reign over mankind. All right, so if you've ever been walking through a museum or an art gallery, you might have noticed that a lot of the art and historical treasure on display is completely exposed. In fact, with the exception of some of the world's most famous pieces of art, you could easily just fall over and damage much of the artwork on display around the world. So what exactly would happen if you did trip and damage an irreplaceable piece of art? Well, as it turns out, probably not all that much. This is mainly because of two things. Well, the first is the museums and art galleries almost always have insurance to cover such damage. Second, accidents do happen, and the people running the museums, they totally understand this. In fact, in nearly every case we could find of a piece of artwork accidentally being damaged, no charges were ever pressed by either the museum or, in some cases, the owner of the art in question. In fact, it appears that the worst that might happen in such a scenario is that you get banned from the museum. For example, let's consider the case of Nick Flynn. Now, Nick was a man who, in 2006, tripped over his shoelace while walking around the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge and knocked over three 17th century vases worth about £175,000, which is about $225,000. Flynn notes of the experience, I snagged my shoelace, missed the step, and crash bang wallop. There were a million pieces of high quality Qing ceramics lying around underneath me. Although I knew the vase would break, I didn't imagine it would be loose and crash into the other two. I'm sure I only hit the first one, and they must have flown across the windowsill and hit the next one, which then hit the other, like a set of dominoes. I can say with my hands on my heart that it was not deliberate, just one of those unbelievably unlucky things that can sometimes happen. 
The museum's official response was merely to send him a letter advising Flynn not to visit the museum again in the near future. Yes, he didn't even technically get banned, just politely asked to abstain from visiting for a while. In fact, the museum didn't even identify Flynn to the public to spare him the embarrassment of being known as the guy who tripped and knocked over three vases that, before encountering Mr. Flynn, had managed to survive about four centuries and six full decades sitting on those very windowsills. We actually only know his name today because the British tabloids went and tracked him down. In another example, this one from 2015, a 12-year-old boy tripped over while visiting a Taiwanese art exhibition. During his fall forward, he managed to punch a hole through a 350-year-old painting. This painting was Flowers by Paula Porpora, valued at about $1.5 million. The organizers of the exhibition went out of their way to assure the boy and his family that they wouldn't be liable to pay any damages nor get in any trouble legally. In fact, one of the organizers publicly insisted that the boy wasn't to blame. In Yet another case in 2010, a young woman, who as per usual with these sorts of things went unnamed publicly, damaged a $130 million Picasso painting. This painting was called The Actor and the young woman fell into it during an art class. The result was a six-inch tear in the lower right-hand corner. In this specific case, the museum officials were more concerned with reporting that the woman was uninjured than the fact that her accident had potentially wiped away half the painting's value. Alright, so we've covered pure accidents and it seems like the repercussions, they're not too bad. But what about negligent cases? All evidence, interestingly, would seem to indicate that museums and galleries are similarly hesitant to do anything to the patron in question. Beyond countless selfie-related accidental destruction of art that has become something of a frequent occurrence in recent years, there is the case of a clock made by artist James Borden that hung in Columbia, Pennsylvania's National Watch and Clock Museum for over two decades before being destroyed. So how exactly did it meet its end? Well, an elderly couple began touching and pulling on its various bits seemingly trying to see what the clock looked like when working. This ultimately caused the clock to come crashing down. The museum they chose not to press charges nor seek any compensation for the damages. In fact, as in other examples, they didn't even berate the individuals in the press, choosing not to even name them at all. That said, we did find one exception to this. This happens when a tourist scaled a facade of a Portuguese train station to take a selfie with an 1890 statue of Dom Sebastio, resulting in the statue's destruction when said tourist accidentally knocked the statue over and it shattered on the ground below. The unnamed man was later charged with destruction of public property. As for the non-public, even in cases where museum or art gallery staff damage or destroy the art, the individual usually gets off with only a slap on the wrist if it was truly an honest accident. For example, in 2000, some porters at the Bond Street auction house accidentally put a painting by artist Lucian Freud, valued at £100,000, which is about $130,000, into a crushing machine. The painting was stored in a large wooden box, which the porters assumed was empty, and they put it out with the rest of the trash. The auction house ensured that the porters would wouldn't leave their jobs over the matter, as it was just an honest mistake. In another case, an unnamed cleaning lady tossed a bunch of modern art valued at about $15,000 into the garbage in 2014. To be fair to the cleaning lady, the so-called art in question was created by modernist Paul Branker, and it was a bunch of cardboard boxes haphazardly strewn across the floor of a section of the gallery. Again, no action was taken against the cleaner. We can only hope that Mr. Branker was on his game that day, and he simply took the opportunity to go full meta on it, displaying his former cardboard box art now in the garbage been, perhaps even increasing its value somewhat. Modern art, everybody. All that said, while it appears most museums, galleries, and even artists will take the destruction or damage of their work in good humor if done accidentally, even if there was a fair bit of negligence involved, the same can't be said if the damage is malicious. In these cases, the museum can and will press charges, and one could even expect a bit of jail time. For instance, in the aforementioned vase-smashing story, sometime later there was some thought that Flynn had smashed the vases on purpose for the publicity of it, given his going out of his way to give interviews about it and some of his comments therein. Despite that the museum had so carefully avoided assigning any blame or mentioning his name. As a result, he was eventually detained for a night, though noted he was treated very well while under arrest, with the police simply trying to determine if he'd done it on purpose. Once they decided that it had indeed been an accident, he was let go with no further consequences. In another instance, one Andrew Shannon punched a Monet painting worth about seven million pounds, which is about nine million dollars. He later claimed that he tripped and fell and it was an accident, but security footage clearly showed him intentionally punching the painting. When he was detained by security guards, a can of paint stripper was also found in his pocket. He was given a five-year prison sentence. 
So this brings us to perhaps the obvious question that surrounds all of this, and that's why why is such valuable and often irreplaceable art stored in such a way that people can simply walk up to it and damage it, whether accidentally or not? Well, one reason is simply cost. Placing every painting, sculpture, and fresco behind protective glass or under careful watch of a burly guard is very expensive. Contrary to the value of the pieces they sometimes contain, museums and art galleries often aren't swimming in money. A second, and perhaps more important reason, is that it would disrupt the experience of viewing the art in question. Ensuring that the art can be properly appreciated is of tantamount importance to those who run museums and galleries. It's noted that said institutions have to constantly strike a balance between keeping works of art accessible to the public and protecting them at the same time. Such a balance necessitates a degree of trust to be placed in the public, not to pour at the priceless works of art on display, and to otherwise be careful around them. Perhaps the most famous example of a piece of art being damaged maliciously is the time a man called Piero Canata attacked Michelangelo's David with a hammer, breaking off the statue's toe. Prior to Kanata's attack, visitors were free to walk right up to the statue to appreciate it up close. Afterwards, it was placed behind a protective glass screen. All right, so let's get into those bonus facts. In 2012, a fishbowl personally painted and signed by Orson Welles belonging to conservative firebrand Glenn Beck was irreparably damaged by a cleaner who assumed the ball was dirty. Contrary to his fiery personality on air, Beck forgave the cleaner, stating, I can't be pissed at her because here's somebody who wants to go above and beyond. Here's somebody who wants to do the right thing, somebody who saw a fishbowl that looks like it hadn't been cleaned since 1940 and took it and washed it. Scrubbed, scrubbed the signature, scrubbed all the little fishes scrubbed it all. And now for another bonus fact. It appears that insurers will cough up to pay for damage to art even if the person who damages it is the owner themselves. As famously happened with casino magnate Steve Wynn after he drove his elbow through a $139 million painting by Picasso while gesturing towards it. After a few months in court, Wynn's insurance did eventually pay up. Wynn later sold the painting for more than it had been valued at prior to the damage. And now for another bonus fact. Speaking of modern art, there is a definite trend of avant-garde modern artists creating pieces mostly made up of literal trash that gets accidentally thrown away by cleaners. Among the many examples of this that we found in researching this piece includes the case of Damien Hirst, the shark in the formaldehyde guy. In 2001, a work of art consisting of pieces of actual trash strategically placed around a room containing other of his works was thrown away by a janitor identified only as Mr. Assair. Assair thought that it was just leftover trash from the opening party the night before. Said Assair, I didn't think for a second that it was a work of art. It didn't look much like art to me, so I cleared it all into bin bags and dumped it. Upon hearing about this, Hurst was reported as finding the whole thing hilarious. A critic of Hurst's work was later quoted as saying, The cleaner obviously ought to be promoted to an art critic of a national newspaper. He clearly has a fine critical eye and can spot rubbish. We've talked about animals who've gone above and beyond what you'd normally expect animals to be capable of, like the cat that works for the British government, and a baboon who worked as a surprisingly good signalman for a railway company. In each case, special accommodations were made for the animals to better help them do their duties. But what accommodations are made when an animal has, shall we say, higher aspirations and enters the world of politics? As it turns out, not all that many. This is largely because in every example of an animal being elected to office that we could find, the position of the animal was ceremonial. And in perhaps the most famous case, saying the animal is even the honorary mayor is something of a stretch. Case in point, you may have heard of a cat called Stubbs who was elected mayor of a small town in Alaska in 1997. There are several variations of Stubbs' story, though the most commonly touted version is that Stubbs became mayor after residents, dissatisfied with the human candidates running for office, elected him as a writing candidate. In actuality, though, Stubbs holds no official position. The whole him being mayor thing is, as one Alaskan resident bluntly put it, a PR scam. Stubbs was never elected on any write-in ballot because there was never an election in the first place. Stubbs isn't the elected mayor or even the elected honorary mayor. He's a marketing stunt perpetrated by the townsfolk of that Alaskan village thanks to a small but thriving cottage industry that has sprung up around their most famous feline resident. Along with some stores selling souvenirs with Stubbs' face on them, the town has also seen an uptick in tourism to the tune of 30 or 40 people a day hoping to meet the mayor. In other words, it's in the best interests of the town called Talkeetna to play up the notoriety of being a town with an elected feline 
mayor. A similar story is that of Bosco Ramos, a black lab Rottweiler mix who was genuinely elected mayor of an unincorporated census-designated place in California called Sunol in 1981. He served in the role for 13 years until his death. How he got the job in the first place was simply that his owner thought the whole thing would be funny, so he entered him into the race under the platform Dogs Are People Too, and with campaign promises including a bone in every dish, a cat in every tree, and a fire hydrant on every corner. Unlike Stubbs, Bosco was elected and even ran against two human beings, both of whom he beat in a landslide. However, his position was described as being purely ceremonial in nature. The same could be said of Duke, a dog who became the honorary mayor of a small town in Minnesota, winning by nine votes. It should be noted now that the town only had 12 residents, which means he kind of won by a landslide. Funny enough, the individual who ran against Duke, one Richard Sherbrooke, even claims he voted for the dog rather than himself. Again, Duke's position was ceremonial, but the residents of the town were happy to have him as mayor, with Sherbrooke describing the idea of having a dog as mayor as pretty cool. Cool or not, since the animals only hold ceremonial positions, there are no official mayoral duties expected of them, nor are there any salaries, assistance, or similar trappings, though the animals are seemingly taken much better care of than most of their respective species. However, just because nobody expects a canine mayor to do anything, it doesn't mean their terms in office aren't gleefully noted by the local populace as if the animal did function as an actual official mayor. Going back to Bosco for a moment, while he was in office, the doggy mayor would regularly meet with the citizens of Sinol, taking daily strolls about the town to meet with his constituents. While serving as mayor, Bosco became something of a celebrity appearing on TV, earning $2,000 to his owner in one such appearance, and at one point caused an international incident when Chinese newspapers widely reported on his election as an example of the shortcomings of democracy and why it should be avoided. Bosco took all of this in his stride, and when the Tiananmen Square incident happened in 1989, he was invited to join protests organized by students at Berkeley and Stanford and stand in front of the Chinese embassy as an honored guest. His owner accepted the offer. Bosco also led the Halloween parade every year and attended formal events wearing a doggy tuxedo. When he wasn't being formal, Bosco was recognizable due to his habit of wearing a red bandana. It wasn't all smooth sailing for Bosco, though, and his tenure wasn't without controversy. One of the most infamous being his liaisons with numerous female dogs while on the clock, resulting in numerous illegitimate pups being sired. In addition, Bosco also went missing for a week in 1987, turning up a week later with a stick in his mouth. He never revealed where he went, so it's assumed he was enjoying a raunchy rendezvous with a female dog. Bosco also frequently got caught being bribed with ice cream and would act aggressively when people withheld his favorite treat, beef jerky. After his death in 1994, the people of Sonol paid tribute to Bosco by erecting a bronze bust of the world's first canine mayor. Despite his well-known love of formal clothing, the artist responsible for Bosco's statue chose to depict him in his everyday attire. So to sum up, when you hear a story about an animal becoming mayor, chances are the position is purely ceremonial and the animal has no official duties to speak of, so they don't need all that much help carrying them out. And yes, in some cases the animal wasn't even elected in the first place, it's just a publicity stunt. And now for a bonus fact. In the Japanese town of Kinokawa, the station master for Kishi Station is a female calico cat called Tama. Tama was a stray that lived near the station and was regularly fed by an employee there. When the station became automated in 2007 to cut costs, Tama was hired and given food instead of a salary so that she wouldn't starve. News of Tama's hiring quickly spread, and the station saw an increase in traffic as people traveled to the station just to see her. Tama is tasked with greeting passengers and even wears a tiny station master hat while working. Working. Born of the Organized Crime Control Act of 1970 and the brainchild of longtime Department of Justice attorney Gerald Schur, the U.S. Marshal Service Witness Security Program, WITSEC, has successfully protected more than 18,000 people since it first began operations in 1971. Membership in the Witness Protection Program is typically for life and usually begins with a visit from U.S. Marshals, whether anticipated or not. While many of the witnesses and their family members have time to make the decision and prepare for their new lives, others are forced to choose rather quickly, even occasionally having to leave within moments of the Marshals arriving. Family members also join, and typically this includes a spouse and children, although sometimes even mistresses have been protected. And since the program requires that all participants leave everything behind, 
means including parents, siblings, assets and identity, innocent family members and informants alike are faced with an impossible decision. Join the program and lose the life you've built, or stay and potentially literally lose your life. Relocation sites are chosen by WITSEC marshals, although families are allowed to choose from several options. The location ultimately chosen is then disclosed to only a few people within the program. Before beginning their new lives, family members are given new identities. One woman, Jackie Taylor, nee Jacqueline Crouch, who was seven when her family entered the program in 1981, later remembered spending hours practicing writing her new name while waiting to be placed. Once a witness has finished testifying, the family is transported to the new location, where they are often put up in a hotel until a suitable home is chosen. Relocated families receive a monthly stipend, along with money for housing and other expenses that are eventually phased out after the adults have had enough time to find a new means of supporting themselves. Early on when the program was being developed, many things fell through the cracks. WITSEC marshals often either had to forge documents or simply failed to provide them for everyone. For example, Jackie Taylor was never given a birth certificate, nor, obviously, is she able to get one from anywhere. So when she was little, she couldn't play softball, then later in life she had a difficult time enrolling in college and getting married. In addition, although today there are set limits for expenses, that policy only came about after some serious growing pains. For example, after the acting head of the Los Angeles crime syndicate, Aladina Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, turned informant in 1978, he was paid nearly $1 million over the next 10 years while in the program. Perhaps worth it, Fratiano's testimony ultimately helped to convict more than two dozen gangsters. On the other hand, in addition to paying for food, housing, living expenses, and healthcare, Witsek was also paying for unnecessary expenses, including Fratiano's wife's plastic surgery and even a monthly stipend for her mother. So in 1987, when Fratiano's information dried up, so did the government's patience, and Witsek cut off his income and stopped providing 24-7 protection. Although Fratiano claimed to fear for his life afterward, he lived for another six years and died in his sleep in 1993. Today, most of the bugs have been worked out, and legally sealed name changes, new social security cards, birth certificates, and driver's licenses are all routinely issued. In addition, medical and school records are quickly transferred and fake credit histories are created. In sum, since 1971, about 8,500 witnesses and 9,900 family members have been protected by WITSEC. And no one who has followed the program's guidelines has ever been killed. However, not everyone successfully transitions into the program. In 1980, Henry Hill testified against his former associates in the Lucchese crime family and was placed in witness protection along with his wife and two kids. Having difficulty adjusting, the Henry Hills, changed to the Martin Lewises and later the Peter Haynesses, had to be relocated ten times from places including Independence, Kentucky, Redmond, Washington, and Omaha, Nebraska. Bored to tears, Henry, or Martin, or Peter, continued with his criminal activities and during the 1980s was arrested for crimes ranging from assault to drunk driving to burglary. In 1985, he outed himself a bit when he worked with Nicholas Pileggi to write his memoir, Wise Guy, which became the 1990s Goodfellas. Shortly thereafter, in 1987, Henry Martin Peter was arrested for trying to sell a pound of cocaine to two DEA agents, which ultimately resulted in his expulsion from the program. Apparently, however, exile didn't cause him too many problems with those he had testified against. Henry lived to 2012 when he died of a heart attack. Have you ever wondered what happens if you stick your head in a particle accelerator? <laughs> Uh, no, but okay. <laughs> well, we hope your curiosity is now piqued, because we're about to tell you, as well as later in the bonus facts, we're going to tell you why the speed of electricity is actually slower than a turtle walks. Wait, I thought electricity was like as fast as the speed of light. Oh, I'm looking forward to learning along with you guys. But first, let's go back to the particle accelerator question. Enter into the picture. Anatoly Petrovich Bogoski. He's a Russian scientist who has the distinction of being the only person to ever stick his head inside a running particle accelerator. Dude, how did you get in that position? I know you're a scientist, but I mean, that should be even more of a reason not to. I mean, I'm not a scientist and I'm like, probably wouldn't stick my head in there. 
Bogorsky was a researcher at the Institute for High Energy Particle Physics in Protvino, working with the Soviet particle accelerator, the Synchrotron U-70, a one-time world record holder for the highest energy accelerator. On the momentous day of July the 13th, 1978, the then 36-year-old man in the prime of his life was checking a malfunctioning piece of equipment. As he was leaning over to take a gander, he accidentally stuck his head through the part of the accelerator that the proton beam was running through. Look, could, I, I don't know anything about particle accelerators, really, but, you know, if I'm going to stick a knife in my toast to get the bread out, I turn the toaster off. If I'm going to stick my head in the particle accelerator, <laughs> I'm going to do the same thing. So what happened? Well, sadly, he didn't get any superpowers, for one, although there is a bit of a caveat to that, which we'll get to in a moment. How exciting. Instead, he reported seeing a flash that was, to quote him, brighter than a thousand suns, but he did not feel any pain when this happened. One can only assume from this that the bright flash was caused via photoreceptors in his retinas being abnormally stimulated. This is akin to the abnormal flash you might see if someone punches you in the head or the like with the sudden jarring causing pressure on the retina, which in turn creates an electrical impulse to the brain, which the brain interprets as a very brief flash. Though those who suffer from migraine headaches often see similar flashes leading up to or during their migraine, something caused by spasming of certain blood vessels in the head. Whatever was happening in Bogorsky's head as a result of the beam to cause the flash, as for the beam itself, it measured 2,000 gray as it entered Bogorsky's skull at the rear of his head and exited around the front corner of his nose. For those unfamiliar, a gray is a unit of energy absorbed from ionizing radiation. One gray is equal to the absorption of one joule of radiation energy by one kilogram of matter. For reference, absorption of over five grays at any time usually leads to death within a couple of weeks. Did they, did we say absorb 2,000 of those guys? <laughs> yes, we did. He's in big trouble. <laughs> However, no one before had ever experienced radiation in the form of a proton beam moving at close to the speed of light. So naturally, Bogorsky was studied closely, with the physicians involved sure that their lab rat wouldn't last long. As for the immediate aftermath, <laughs> and just a comment, this, if this was gonna happen anywhere, it would be in the Soviet Union, wouldn't it? <laughs> As for the immediate aftermath, Bogorsky's someone had a go at me on Twitter the other day for set sounding superior when I made a joke about the Soviet Union. It's like, dude, it's the Soviet Union, come on! As for the immediate aftermath, Bogorsky's left half of his face swelled up beyond recognition. In the days following, the skin on their part of his face and the back of his head where the beam hit peeled off, and it was observed via extensive examination that the beam had burned through his skull and his brain tissue. Can't say that shocks me there. <laughs> as for his intellectual capacity, this remained seemingly the same as before as far as all tests done on him could tell. The few negative health drawbacks he did experience were not life-threatening either. The few negative health... Yeah, but they were pretty mega. His skull was disintegrating. Eh, it's just a scratch. He lost the hearing in his left ear and experienced a constant unpleasant noise in that ear from then on. The left half of his face slowly became paralyzed over the course of the next two years. <laughs> Minor health drawbacks. He also reported getting significantly more fatigued with mental work, though he did go on to get his PhD after this incident and continued his work as a scientist without apparent issue on the mental capacity front. The remaining side effects were occasional absence seizures and later tonic-clonic seizures, though these didn't sharp right away. For those unfamiliar, absence seizures, also called petty mal seizures, are generally marked by the person more or less seeming to stare off into space for a period of time, usually a few seconds. Contrary to popular perception, here, generally during these seizures, there is no abnormal muscle activity. In contrast, tonic-clonic seizures often involve extreme muscle rigidity and sometimes violent contractions, basically some version of what most people think of when discussing seizures. In any event, the most bizarre side effect that occurred because of his little incident has to do with his face. While the right side of his face more or less aged, as you would expect, ultimately nice and wrinkled as the years dragged on, the left half of his face revealed a slight superpower. The ability to seem not to age, showing markedly less wrinkling, even for a time, none at all, even as the other side was getting nice and weathered. 
Essentially, this left him looking like someone who tipped his plastic surgeon extremely well, or maybe more aptly only paid for half an operation given only half of his face looked fabulous. Maybe stick the other side of your face in the particle accelerator. Apparently, Botox has got nothing on a particle accelerator's beam for reducing wrinkles. Of course, given the particle accelerator paralyzed the one side of his face, this is seemingly somewhat similar to Botox, except in this case it was a permanent effect. As for how long he lived after this incident, as you might have guessed, given our mention of his elderly wrinkles, it turns out a long time. In fact, as far as we can find, the 77-year-old Bogorski is still alive today, though we weren't able to find any interviews with him in the last decade. But the key here is there's no record of his death. Speaking of bright flashes, if you ever see a ton of eye floaters, those oddly shaped objects that may appear floating around when you look at bright things like the sky, suddenly appear in your field of vision, potentially followed by or at the same time as a lot of bright flashes, get thee to an eye doctor post haste. Because there's a chance, about one in seven, that your retina is going to detach from the back of your eye. A guy at university I know got a detached retina. His eye was all, I was gonna swear, it was pretty messed up for a while. So get thee to an eye doctor. If that happens, you have very little time to get it fixed before it effectively dies and you go blind in that eye. Serious stuff, chaps. And at this point, if you're wondering here what actually causes eye floaters, these are not optical illusions, but rather something your eyes are actually perceiving. There are a few different things that can cause this, but in most cases, these eye floaters are caused by pieces of the gel-like vitreous breaking off from the back portion of your eye and then floating around in your eyeball. The vitreous humor, or often just vitreous for those who hate comedy, but a boom boom is a clear gel that fills the gap between your retina and lens, helping maintain the round shape of your eye in the process. This gel is about 99% water and 1% other elements, the latter of which consists mostly of a network of hyaluronic acids and collagen. Whenever we get sciency, I need to crack out my pronunciation dictionary. Although nobody believes that I actually do this. <laughs> Here you go. Hyaluronic. Hyaluronic. Hyaluronic acid ends up retaining water molecules. Over time, though, this network breaks down, which results in the hyaluronic acid releasing its trapped water molecules. When this happens, it forms a watery core in your vitreous's body. As you age, then, bits of this still gel-like collagen hyaluronic acid network will break off and float around in this watery center. When light passes through this area, it creates a shadow on your retina. This shadow is actually what you are seeing when you see the eye floaters. These floaters are microscopic in size and only appear as big as they do because of their proximity to the retina. Unfortunately, their microscopic nature makes them almost impossible to treat in most cases. Interestingly, if the eye floaters would just stay still instead of floating around, your brain would automatically just tune them out and you'd never consciously see them. Your brain does this all the time with things both in and outside your eyes. One example of this inside your eye are blood vessels in the eye which obstruct light because they are in a fixed location relative to the retina. Your brain tunes them out completely and you don't consciously perceive them. Indeed, there's an amazing, I think it's like where the optic nerve is, there's this amazing optical illusion you can do where it's, you know, on your computer screen or whatever and it says, look at the dot and then you can't see these two points on this strip it's crazy and i'm describing it terribly uh here we go let's move on the reason you can see floaters better when looking at for instance a bright blue sky is because your pupils contract to a very small size thus reducing the aperture which in turn makes floaters more apparent and focused moving on speaking of the speed of light you may be under the impression that electricity moves at such speeds i absolutely was as i mentioned at the start of the video Apparently, I'm an ignorant fool. The truth is, electrons actually flow through something like common copper wire at speeds significantly slower than a turtle walks. You see, each wire that conducts a flow of electrons producing usable electric current is composed of billions of atoms. To move along it, the electrons have to traverse these atoms, randomly zigzagging their way as they do, resulting in the net flow rate called drift velocity in a given direction being rather slow. How slow exactly? Well, to calculate it, we will use this formula. I equals N by A by V by Q, or V equals L over brackets open, N by A by Q brackets closed. Okie dokie that I have no idea what I'm talking about. I is the current 
n is the number of electrons per cubic meter, a is the cross section of the wire, q is the charge of an electron, and v is the drift velocity of the electrons. And thus, this is a perfect demonstration of why the people who write these scripts are much smarter than your boy Simon. Since the number of electrons in a copper wire n is 8.5 by 1028 per meters cubed, and the charge of an electron q is 1.6 by 10 to 19 c. If we also know the cross-sectional area and the current, we can calculate the electron's drift velocity. <laughs> Whoever wrote this can, I can't. <laughs> For example, suppose you have a current of 14 amps in a copper wire with a cross-section of 3 by 10 to 6 meters squared. Plug in all the numbers and you get that the electron's moving at a speed of 3.4 by 10 to 4 meters per second, or about one third of a millimeter per second. To put in values that are easier to conceptualize, this works out to about 1.2 meters, 4.1 feet per hour, a rate far slower than the average box turtle, which can cover about 800 feet in that same amount of time. <laughs> Appreciate the analogies because Otherwise, I'd remain confused. <laughs> so, how is it that something that is essentially slower than a turtle can more or less instantaneously turn on a light across a room? Well, that's a chain reaction, folks. The atoms in the wire are crammed together cheek to gel, which, while it makes the going slow, also has the electrons more or less abutting one another. When the switch is turned on, thanks to the electrical potential difference created by the generator, a force is created to move the electrons, with each pushing its neighbor, which in turn pushes its neighbor, and so on all the way through the wire. So while no electrons zoom through the wire to turn on the light as you might have previously thought, it ends up seeming like that is what is happening. This is not unlike how, when you turn on your faucet water instantly comes out despite the fact that your water source might be many many miles away